This is Proxy Countdown. Welcome to the big show for the week of February 5th, 2024, alongside my tag team partner, Matt Muscardi. I'm Damian Rollis on today's countdown. Significant board leadership changes at three large cap companies. Is the Grim Reaper coming for the O'Reilly brothers at o- O'Reilly Automotive? Disney uses an animated duck to tell shareholders how to vote. Exxon won't take no for an answer after suing to get no for an answer. And on the big vote, Matt dives into a Midwestern tractor company. Let's begin uh, at our trade wire. In significant leadership changes, a big shakeup at Honeywell, a CEO, Vimal Kapur, adds board chair to his LinkedIn resume as former CEO and chair Darius Adam Check, and his 29% influence is set to officially depart from the board. Also, William Ayer will become the board's new independent lead director, replacing Scott Davis. At CF Industries, Christopher Bone has been promoted to COO and added to the board. The board is already dominated by CEO Tony Will and his 25% influence. So CF Industries there is adding uh, adding the CEO further, consolidating executive power. And a significant hole will need to be filled at Cadence Design Systems as longtime chair and director John Chauvin, who has been on the board since 1992 when Kurt Cobain was still alive, will be stepping down. And other notable resignations, Jay Birchfield, who has been a director since the Clinton administration, is stepping down at O'Reilly Automotive because of a retirement policy that limits board age to 78. This means the clock is ticking on the O'Reilly brothers, David and Larry, who are 73 and 76 years old, respectively. The O'Reilly brothers have been directors at O'Reilly Automotive since the Nixon administration. Hey, the O'Reilly, like most of the auto parts companies, seem to make their directors wear matching outfits in the bios. Except for the latest edition and the only person of color currently on the board, Fred Whitfield, who wore his own suit. The real question actually is, whoever replaces Jay Birchfield, forced to wear a baby blue auto worker shirt or not? Ray Young resigned from the Hormel Foods Board. Here's a quote from that filing. Uh, Having meaningfully contributed to the board during his tenure. It's nice. The former vice chair at Archer's Daniels Midland, Ray is a heavy hitter with 14% of influence at Hormel and 19% of influence at International Paper. Overall, however, he is hitting just 296, a low performing director there. Thank you for your meaningful contribution. And notable director adds Mondelay International is adding Helion CEO Brian McNamara. Gilead Sciences is adding Ted Love, who already serves on both the boards of Seagen and Royalty Farmer. And at Barbie's Mattel, two new directors have been added to the board. Julius Janikowski, who already serves at Sonos and MasterCard. And Don Ostroff, who sits on the board of Paramount Global. And lastly, in our trade wire, and an unusual move at a large cap company, microchip technology is reducing salaries for its CEO, NEOs, and the board members by 20% to match other expense reduction actions at the company. I, I don't remember ever seeing directors reducing their own pay. While it doesn't represent a significant reduction, it's about you know nineteen thousand for board members and roughly a hundred thousand thirty thousand for CEO Ganesh Murthy. It's it's worth noting that since most pay elements of the executive pay are tied to base salary, it should reduce in further reductions for the CEO. And so is that a reduction in options granted, or are the options going to remain the same, just cheaper because the price of the stock has been dropping? All good questions. Let's move over to our proxy cage matches. At the Walt Disney Company, who is currently engaged in a three-way steel cage match between Tryon and Blackwell, 
Uh, they released an uh, an animated video featuring Professor Ludwig von Drake to tell Disney's shareholders how to vote. This is a gray-haired and balding duck. And the duck in this video, posted by Disney, was extremely straightforward, saying, quote, Remember, it's important you vote only for Disney's 12 nominees and do not vote for the Tryon Group or Blackwell's nominees. Uh, Tryon, meanwhile, has been busy filing its uh, proxy contestations. One that stood out featured a picture of former CFO and Tryon board nominee Jay Rusulo with a quote saying merely, the Disney I know has lost its way. Oh, is everyone involved in this proxy cage match a child? They they released an animated duck giving proxy voting instructions. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, 65% of the shares are institutionally held, and the average retail vote is about 30% of the remaining shares, meaning that this video was geared to what? 10% of their shareholders? Unless they are meant to encourage institutions to watch an animated duck give them proxy voting instructions. While Tryon's strategy seems to be be Netflix for revenue, but old Disney for all the other stuff. At this point, my instinct, and we'll do Disney when it gets closer to the AGM, I'm sure, is vote them all out. Vote out every director except maybe James Gorman, who just got there. So it can't possibly be his fault yet. And in an update to a previous story covered here at the Proxy Countdown, activist investor Arjuna Capital and climate activists follow this have withdrawn their climate resolution from ExxonMobil's upcoming annual meeting after Exxon made the unusual move to sue them. After the court stated that it struggles to see what the ongoing case or controversy is in this matter, given the only relief sought from the court was a declaration that Exxon may exclude defendant's proposal from its annual shareholder meeting. Exxon told a federal judge that the lawsuit should continue. Honestly, this is a terrible look, and it's not a terrible look for Exxon. Arjuna, you have a right as the owner of the company to file this proposal. A National Legal Policy Research Center is filing proposals all the time that say incredibly heinous stuff. Investors will vote, and that is it. And if Exxon doesn't like it, they're bringing you to court when they're just looking to bypass the SEC. The SEC will make this ruling, this determination. You should stand up and say, if I back down as an owner now— I am setting a precedent that all you have to do is sue and be a big corporation and I will get you to remove any proposal I don't like just through threat of lawsuit. It will stop people from filing lawsuits that are reasonable to other investors. I think the bad look here is not on Exxon. They're just being bullies doing what bullies do. And they're being ridiculous. Remember, this is the engine number one board doing it too. This is on Arjuna. You you need capital to fight this? No, crowdsource it, for Christ's sake. But this is something that you absolutely should be fighting for. Moving over to our vote results table. Let's start with one notable vote at a smaller cap company at, at Polish.com. A proxy contest by a single investor with two shares. Gerald Haman failed as Gerald's bid to be added to the board was rejected by shareholders. Hats off to Mr. Two Shares, however, as he did receive the support of 20% of the vote. I love this. I love it. Two shares. Good work, Gerald. I love it. At large cap companies, the only annual meeting last week occurred at Hormel Foods, where nothing really notable happened. This year's uh, most disliked director, however, is Stephen Lacey, who, despite receiving the support of 94% of shareholders, still registered 5 million more votes against his re-election than any other director. But it's not the only notable thing. Investors passed exculpation of directors proposal, meaning directors are now uh, have maximum limited liability from uh, legally for uh, as fiduciaries, uh, according to Delaware law. And more investors voted against 
Stephen Lacey and Gary Bajwani, who's the nominating chair and Lacey's the comp chair, then voted against exculpation. So basically what they said was Bajwani and Lacey, they can ignore parts of their fiduciary duty. That's fine. But we really don't like what the nom chair and the comp chair are doing. And other smaller cap companies say on pay failed at Enzo Biochem. Hamid Erfanian was CEO for less than two years and managed to walk away with nearly $1 million in cash, a grant of restricted shares worth $1.5 million, and the immediate vesting of almost 200,000 restricted shares and 700,000 options. While there are 21 million votes against say on pay, two pay committee members somehow managed to receive 9 million more votes in their favor. Uh, can I uh, ask you something? This is a real question. I would need your opinion here. Is there anything more passive aggressive than a majority vote against pay, but re-electing the directors <laughs> that set the pay? I'll never understand it. I mean, it's like Tony Soprano's mom is the is doing the votes. Like it's so passive aggressive to me. Vote against the directors. They're the ones who set the pay. Uh, laziness, that's right, laziness wins at Moog as a shareholders, uh, a shareholders determined that say on pay votes should be held only every three years and not annually, which is the custom. And finally, a PSA that we need to immediately ban all staggered board elections. Shareholder votes at Bell Ring Brand, Digi International, Twist Bioscience, and Golub Capital all showed signs of disgruntled shareholder voters. And yet it is forever stupid that they can't have a say on the entire board every 12 months. So they're only able to pinpoint their distaste at two directors every few years. I, here's a PSA. Let's just get rid of all stacker elections. I, I can get behind that PSA, yeah. All right, that's uh, that's it for our news. Let's go over to the big vote uh, for today. For this week, we are covering the Midwestern company Deer, Deer and Company. They will be holding their annual vote on February twenty eighth, twenty uh, twenty four, twenty February twenty eighth. So. Before I hand it over to Matt, who has a lot to say here on this board, I want to, uh, some general observations from my perspective. First of all, uh, according to our data, this board performs pretty well overall, hitting 594. Remember, the average is about 500, so, you know, pretty good. Uh, uh, the lead director is stepping down, Charles Holiday. He's leaving the board. That means that Sherry Smith, who has actually been on the board for 13 years, the second longest serving director, is now the the, the lead independent director. So This is a joke in and of itself. Yes. In the UK, she would not be considered independent, but here she'll be the lead independent director. And also, um, I want to point out two other things. Deere has a retirement policy set at the age of 75, and there are four directors who are over 70 at Deere. Clayton Jones, Michael Johans, Gregory Page, Sheila Talton. So... That looks like if they stick to their own policies, that we're going to have quite a bit of turnover in the upcoming years. And finally, I wanted to point out something about the skills matrix at, at manufacturing company Deere. So this is their own uh, reporting. This is not mandated by the SEC or any of the listing exchanges. But they claim that the entire board is 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 has a skills or background in being an executive, right? 100% of the board are executives, but uh, only 36% of the board have skills in manufacturing and only 36% show skills in agriculture. And before we even get into yeah. the overview that I have, it, it is worth saying that on these skills matrices, if you didn't listen to our Apple show, we went did a deep dive on them. I just, just, just to get an eyeball full, looked at Sherry Smith, who's now the incoming lead director. Mm -hmm. Um, at 13 years of tenure, independent director. Uh, she's tagged as having executive experience here at Deere and Company, but on Piper Sandler, 
uh, the other board that she's on, she is tagged as not having executive experience. So these skills matrices are notoriously fickle and make believe. They are unicorns. But let's get into the yeah. Big let's get to the uh, proposal number one at Deer Company election of eleven directors. Matt, what say you? Look, it's hard to be angry at these directors. They have outperformed the S and P five hundred. This year, one year, two year, five year, they mm -hmm. they pay an annual dividend. It's a cash flow cow. They've got ongoing buybacks. They did seven billion in buybacks in 2023. Um, investors have a lot to like about this company. It throws off cash. And it's a very consistent company for the most part. The biggest problems they've faced in the last few years are the right to repair lawsuits, which arguably have been going back to 2002, 2000 even, um, which are farmers did not have the right to repair their own broken tractors or, or equipment. Uh, deer would have to come in. It was all proprietary. They sealed everything and they made it very difficult to get anything done. And there was a strike in 2021, 10,000 workers Strike. It was actually UAW-led strike. Um, that was settled also in late in 2021. But those are, you know, the biggest sort of issues that um, a deer has faced. Deer does say in their annual report and in their proxy uh, in their risks that the right to repair issue is ongoing, even though a law was passed at the beginning of 2023 giving farmers the right to re repair their things. This is a high-performing team. You said you said 594 overall. It's an aristocratic board, highly educated. They're all mostly executives or entirely executives. They actually have the rare combination of nearly all of them have high TSR batting averages and high earnings batting averages, meaning not only are they making the money, but investors are rewarding them for making the money. This is And this is across all the boards that they're on. So these are high-performing board members for the most part. They're also highly interconnected. More than half of the board is connected to one another through other boards. Yeah. And two-thirds of the board comes from one board community, meaning they're friends of friends of friends, like they, they roughly know each other. Well, I will let me add that two board members, Michael Johans, former U.S. Senator of Nebraska, and Greg Page, former CEO at Cargill, they sit on the same board together right now at Corteva. Right. Yeah. Yes, right. They're both on Corteva. Um, and uh, the, the board community that this particular board is from is something that we fondly talk about here. Um, it's related to Abbott Labs. It is the Midwest Mafia boards. It's mostly Chicago. There are a lot of American widget makers and manufacturers and a mix of pharma in there. It's really American board royalty. Uh, Boeing draws a lot of members from it. It includes, I went back to 1998. I went through every proxy from 1998 on and looked at the companies that were represented on their boards, not the individuals, but the where they came from. This is Abbott Labs, Cardinal Health. There's been at least one director from Cardinal Health contiguously on the Deer Board for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, Archer Daniel Midland, Snap-On Inc., multiple directors from Snap-On, Maytag, which became Whirlpool, Northern Trust, S.C. Johnson, 3M, um, which has connections everywhere throughout the Midwest. There's a company, Sharing Plow, from the late 90s and early aughts, there were three to four directors on the Deer board at any time from Shearing Plow's board. Uh, Merrill Lynch, B of A, um, th this is Northrop Grumman. These are all massive industrial American companies and relatively board royalty. So this is your backdrop. High-performing board members, professional board members, well-connected to one another board members. The network power is um, amongst the top uh, of, of the boards that we look at, and they're, they, they all come from the same pool of companies, effectively. Here's the proxy strategy that right. I, when you and I sat down in pre-production and thought about this, because this isn't a vote out an outlier board. This isn't, there's a bottom performer, there's some really weird thing happening, there's a lot of compromise, something or other. This is actually more a question, it's more like Apple. It's a play for the future. What's your plan for the future? And I wanted to answer one question with my thinking on the, this, these recommendations, which is, is Deer & Company an agricultural company or a tech company? Okay. That's the backdrop. And when I say agricultural, I mean analog agricultural. I, we know it's a hybrid, right, uh, roughly, but where is it going? So their own future plans that they put into their 
last annual report included from December included autonomous farming vehicles, data collection. So as the tractor goes over the field, it collects data on moisture, weather, the, uh, the thickness of the plants, the tilt of the land. They want to collect everything. Alternative powered vehicles like electric vehicles or hybrids and even AI farming. Now, everybody has to say AI about everything. But the macro trend behind this is a move towards vertical farming, as in $10 billion of vertical farming is expected by 2026, 35 billion by 2032. Regenerative agriculture is a big deal given climate change. Water management is a huge challenge. So you have a company that is effectively built off of an analog product, which is dragging something along the ground, ripping out plants, planting new plants, that needs to pivot to face a future with less useful land, potentially less water, mm -hmm. more autonomous farming. Um, so who on this company board are the guardrails for that future? A future with less water, more indoor farming, and more automation. Right. And that again, is my starting point. Yeah. And this is why I pointed out the company's retirement policy, because you do have four directors slated to exit this board. So there's a real opportunity here for shareholders to care about the next generation of board members. And you mentioned the skills matrix. There's only two directors on this board that have experience in both manufacturing and agriculture. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the CEO. Uh -huh. The other one is Greg Page, who, as you said, is 72 years old. Right. He's been on board for 11 years, and he's coming up against the retirement age. The fact that the retirement policy has four directors basically in its sight in the next four years is actually an opportunity for mm -hmm. an investor who wants to pivot to whatever the future of Deere and Company is going to be. On top of that, you have Sherry Smith, who's now the lead independent director, who's not close to retirement, but has been there for 13 years. So if you really think about it, five of the 11 directors are potential refreshment targets for the next couple of cycles. So far, if you want to know what Deere has thought about the future, you can look at the last three directors they added, 2020, 2021, 2023. Those directors are Neil Hun, who's from a CEO of Roper Technologies. Yep. The the on Roper Technologies board are B of A, where Charles Holiday, who's re just retired, he was at. Allied Signal Honeywell, um, GE. These are all People like companies where Deere has sourced their own directors. Mm -hmm. This is more of the same. In 2020, they added Tamara Irwin. She's a marketing exec from Verizon. On Verizon's board is someone from Metric Steam, also on Roper's board. You have Roxanne Austin from the Abbott and Target boards. These are all the same community. Leanne Carrot, they added in 2021. She's an exec from Boeing who's connected to everybody. We talk about Boeing all the time. She's actually on the board of Raytheon with the ex-Rockwell Collins CEO, who is Clayton Jones's successor on the Deer board. So we have heavily effectively, board. Yep. it's heavily connected. They're more of the same. They're not differentiating their new directors. According to their own skills matrix, these three directors they added have tech experience, but none of them have AI, automation experience, target growth areas. None of them talk about software. They're all basically tech like aerospace tech, which yeah. sure uses some of that, but that's not necessarily well, the core experience. Uh, well, I'll tell you is that what you're pointing out is an unfortunate wrinkle in the American director uh, appointment cycle, which is that the boards appoint these directors first, right? Yes, and, and then the shareholders uh, vote on them. And as we have pointed out many, many times, direct, uh, the shareholders just rubber stamp whatever the boards decide. But also, the, these are not contested elections. So you're not given a choice between someone who might have a background in AI versus someone who has a background in having a lot of friends on the board, right? So this is part of the problem of the American system of board elections. In fact, one of the things I did for this company in particular was what I like to think of as a true independence test, because they all register. There's 11 members of the board, 10 of whom register as independent, and the CEO is the last one. But I wanted to eliminate directors who are not connected, 
who are eliminate the directors who are connected to one another that are uh, over tenured, uh, more than 10 years. Eliminate any directors that don't have skills uh, or have too many skills overlaps with mm-hmm. other directors. Um, and eliminate them when they have educational backgrounds that overlap. Like, I don't want 10 people from Stanford, right? Mm-hmm. And then finally, diversity is a question, right? Like you don't want 100% white men on the board. You want different perspectives. But when you do this sort of um, uh, true independence test on the dear board, first you eliminate the CEO, obviously. He can't be truly independent. The tenure cap eliminates three directors. The director connections eliminates three more. Independent skills eliminates another one. You have multiple aerospace um, directors on this board. Diversity count ends up with, when I'm done, I've, I've effectively, I have four that might actually be de- independent, and it's two white women, one black woman and white guy, and the black woman is up against the age cap, right? right. So so we have a real independence problem okay. on Deer if you're thinking of it from an independent standpoint. So here are my recommendations. Yeah, let's get Deer. to it. What do you, what do you recommend? That. The vote at Deer, February 28th. So I'm actually going to say you vote for all the directors. Okay. This unusual year. move, yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I, in an unusual move Very for me. Very positive, Matt Muscardi, yes. But the goal here is to engage in replacing the nominate, nominating committee chair, Clayton Jones. He is retiring next year. Yep. Ideally, he's going to be on the board for the next year, yep. but uh, by bylaw anyway. And you also have Michael Johans. He's on the committee as well. He's one more year away mm-hmm. from being forced off the board anyway. You want to engage with the nominating committee at this point. You want to. You actually want to be, if you're an investor, in a place where you're choosing who's leading the nominating committee. You want the nominating committee not run by the cozy types. Choose them from the true independent directors. The true independent directors are uh, 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 Adam or uh, Alan uh, Huberger. Right, um, he uh, is Cascade. He owns. Yep. Cascade just owns eight percent of the stock. Major shareholder. Mm-hmm. They're a major shareholder. There's no one more independently minded than a major shareholder who is going to hold this for long periods of time and needs to think about what is this investment five to ten years from now, not just right now. Right. Yeah. Um. So I think you actually choose some of the you you p- forward p- your your uh, position yourself for the forward thinking like of nomination by like choosing it. the true independent directors. Yeah. It's and it's then, worth. I was gonna say it's worth pointing out that three of the the four nomination committee members are all in that over seventy year old club. So you have a real opportunity here for future board refreshment. And I and I like the idea of engagement. Instead of an aggressive attack, you're engaging with the board b- before we get to that point, right? Yes. This is a conversation. Yeah. Yes. And it's a conversation in advance of knowing you're going to need to refresh. You want your representatives to be leading the refreshment on this board. And then next year, you have targets. Next year, Sherry Smith, she's not independent. You need to mm-hmm. think about what that means to have a non-independent lead independent director. Greg Page, he is a perfect target to replace with AI or tech experience or even an actual farmer of some kind, mm-hmm. someone who uses the technology that they create. So those are my recommendations. It's vote okay. for everyone this year and you engage to replace engage. the nominating committee members over time. Let's get to the second proposal uh, that we'll talk about today, which is say on pay. I I don't have a lot to say here. Last year, shareholders supported this. uh, 93% said yes. Uh, They have made some notable improvements over the last year, including discontinuing the use of long-term incentive cash, which is a corporate governance no-no. You you always, long-term pay should always be tied to equity. Uh, But they have some some kind of boneheaded moves as well. There have been some base salary increases uh, for NEOs. Also, the um, the CEO's targets have been tweaked upwards from 100 and his, his target payout from 180% to 200%, which doesn't seem like a lot to shareholders. But when you do the actual math, it means that he's entitled to well over a million or $2 million more in cash. That's a lot. Because yeah. of these very slight adjustments in target uh, percentages, uh, Otherwise, the the only other thing that stands out to me, which I think is important, is that there's a TSR, uh, total shareholder return modifier, that pays out 
at 75% of target, even if the company is at or below the 25th percentile according versus its peers, which means there, and there's no language in there that states that even if it's the dead, the worst, the last company underperforming its all, its entire peer group, executives still receive 75% of the targeted pay there in that category. So that's, that's pretty poor. So what do you, what's your takeaway for say on pay? How would you vote? Look, I, I, it's hard to vote against these kinds of things I, like because mostly I want to focus on the pay committee and not the pay itself. I think if you're going to vote against pay because you don't like the pay, you vote against the pay members of the pay committee, get them out um, uh, on top of voting against the pay itself. But for point of reference, I can't get over these TSR modifier payouts yeah. at or below the 25th percentile. I ran the numbers. And if I look at the 2023-2024 basket, NBA basketball season, mm -hmm. the 25th percentile points scored performer is Reggie Bullock from Houston. Okay, 25th you, percentile, okay. 25th percentile. If you've never heard of him, that's because he's in the 25th percentile of points scored. <laughs> yeah. That's right. why you've never heard of him. He makes on his current contract $2 million per, per year. I actually think we should make the ceiling of any – any CEO's pay, if they're in the 25th percentile, whatever the 25th percentile of a sport gets paid. And then we'll okay. see whether or not it's – then yeah. you, you still got $2 million bucks. It's, it's still look, something. It's worth pointing out that the average NBA player makes roughly $9 million. So that 25th percentile pay means something in the NBA. It, it does. It means something a lot. And yeah. and by the way, just so you know, Bullock's jet allotment happens to be zero dollars, not the hundred and forty five thousand or whatever that uh, May gets here. So, so what's your, your so you despite this, you're saying despite vote yes this, on pay, but if I'm, if you're just upset at pay, vote against the committee members. Is that what correct. you're saying? That's what okay. I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and finally, let's uh, wrap up the show by talking about some shareholder proposals at Deer coming up uh, election uh, February twenty eighth. I will point out that. Uh, last year, there was very strong support for a termination pay proposal by uh, John Shevedin. 41% of shareholders voted in favor of that. In fact, there is another proposal up by John this year, uh, a shareholder ratification of golden parachutes, which is you know very similar. So um, I would hope that at this point that shareholders push this one over the top and that Deere also support this because 41% is effectively a yes. Well, I can't get over my philosophical rejection of the idea of a golden parachute in the first place. Like, mm -hmm. like, in what other job do you get paid a tremendous amount of money <laughs> for quitting? Like, yeah. that doesn't happen. Not, Reg not Reggie Bullock for the Houston Rockets. That's yeah, not exactly. That Reggie Bullock's yeah. not getting any money no. because he quit. And to um, be fair, he already received a lot of money. And, and it's worth pointing out that the CEO at Deere uh, received $27 million uh, last year. So he doesn't need... A, a golden well, parachute. Do you mean another when he ten leaves? or twenty no, four? No. I mean, like, look, I, I get it for vest, vesting, you know, options on change of control or something like that. But let's be real. We, we don't pay. Can you imagine a situation in which I left middle management at MSCI and got paid a thank you for showing up or, or, and quitting? Like, what? What? Nowhere else does this happen. So I, I, I'm always against that. So I'm voting for Chevette. Anything Chevette does, for the most part, I'm going to vote for. Okay. And that's uh, that's the only uh, shared proposal that. Makes Makes sense. The other two are back to the anti woke, anti ESG category. Uh, these these two entities are now seem to be appearing on every single S and P five hundred uh, annual meeting. That's the National Legal and Policy Center and the National Center for Public Policy Research. It's very if you're clever. Confused, so very is everyone. clever how they're basically <laughs> the same entity. But there are two votes at the Deer uh, annual meeting this year. One is a, a customer and company sustainability congruency report. And the other one is a civil rights non-discrimination and return to merit audit. That's my favorite. Return, return to, to merit, merit. Audit. Whatever return that means, merit, right? Because yes. we don't, we still don't have the full methodology as, as to what what it means, uh, what that means, right? Like who? I, I just like the assumption. What? Yeah, go ahead. I, that um, that merit was what it was. What it right? was. Like, so this is a what, this is a Jim Crow era. Pre civil rights era, right? That's what I, that's my assumption. Well, all I know is that I went the back same 25 groups, the same years. Same groups that, uh, that are angry at DEI. Yeah, go ahead. I went back 25 years and looked at the board, and they all knew each other. Like they all were on boards together. Where was the merit for how they got those positions? But that's not, you can't argue the facts mm -hmm. with a National Center for Public Policy Research. 
the first one, the, the sustainability congruency report, I, I pulled out a quote mostly because I think it's funny. They talk about how deer has been powered by fossil fuels and it has three major industries, agriculture, forestry, and construction slash mining, and then says the company's perception of the science behind climate change and uh, is deeply flawed. In fact, expansion of costly wind and solar energy require massive swaths of land, much of which is converted from agricultural use or necessitates clear cutting of forests. <laughs> so they uh, yeah. they really weirdly yeah. said well, in their own thing, you do forestry, you need to clear cut forests in order to do wind and solar. I don't know why deer. It's a, yeah. <laughs> it's a weird one. It's a pro, uh, it's a pro they're using the, a pro environmental stance to be anti pro environment. Yes, it's anti pro <laughs> It's all trolling. It's all political theater. These votes, Matt, they they routinely get about 1% of shareholder support. That's so, right. This yeah. is another no. You're honoring and the, them even by talking about them. What about the other well, one? Well, the other one was even a lot funnier because it basically it demands that you generate a report engaging like uh, civil rights groups and then says, but not just civil rights groups that are left-leaning. You need mm -hmm. right-leaning civil rights groups. Do they and exist? name some, yeah. that, like some of their friends. Just basically, it says, do a report after talking to our friends. I just love anything that's that that's ridiculous and specific. Vote no to both of them. Uh, um, they're yeah. ridiculous. I'm going to wrap up uh, Matt's, Matt's uh, recommendations on deer and company, which is vote for the entire board, but engage. Engage with deer to get some some fresh blood uh, on the board because we have four directors hitting a retirement age policy soon. Vote yes on say on pay, but but if you're leaning towards no, vote against composition committee members. And finally, uh, vote yes on John Shevedin's share proposal, but a big fat no on the anti-woke proposals. That's it. That's the proxy countdown for the week of February 5th, 2024. Join us next week when we jump back into the alternative democracy pool, forever on the lookout for shareholder sharks, floating band-aids, and wayward directions.